Ola Eriksrud, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here, Rob. This is this is brilliant. I, I've listened to you for many years. This is this is awesome. Does it put you to sleep at night? Does it give you a nice little <laughs> get you into a nice I, little nap? I, I don't know if it's putting me to sleep, but it's it's really, really nice to have it. And actually I do listen to it in the afternoon and evenings. So you're absolutely right. Good. I shouldn't say that really, because I know that people aren't listening to to hear from me. It's the guests. So the guests will definitely not send you to sleep, only uh, inspire and educate. So Ola, thank you very much for, for, for coming on. I really do appreciate your time. Would you mind just giving us a bit of an intro to you? So anyone that doesn't know who you are, they can uh, get a bit of background. No, absolutely. Uh, I think I would consider myself kind of like a movement idiot. Uh, this started, you know, way back in high school when I would sit at the local shopping center and, and look at how people moved. And uh, fortunately, I'm lucky enough to actually be able to, to work with movement. So that's, that, that's pretty neat. Uh, from a formal perspective, a uh, physical therapist uh, from the University of Connecticut. So I lived over in Connecticut for 10 years. And then I came back to Norway and uh, started at the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences uh, early 2000s, 2005. Uh, been there ever since and then uh, progressed to take my PhD in biomechanics and, uh, and, and motor control. Uh, so my role here now at the, uh, at the university is both research and teaching, uh, mostly into the applied application of, of testing and, and, and training. Uh, some, some stuff on the mechanistic side as well, but, but mostly into the applied domain. I uh, work as a consultant with the Norwegian Olympic Paralympic Committee, uh, ranging from coordination, technique, uh, strength and conditioning, but also a little bit on the physio side. And uh, working uh, in a couple of startups, uh, one of them being co-founders of, of, of 1080 Motion uh, back in the day, as well as a, another company called 1080 Map. So uh, I'd like to view myself as a mix between the theoretical academia uh, person, but as well as the applied person. So I like the applied domain very, very, very much. And as a hobby on the side, I coach a boys uh, 15 basketball team. So uh, I'm busy with movement all day, basically. So that was that that was that was that was a a, a short version of it. So. Uh, it gives gives people a little bit of perspective of who I am and where I'm coming from. But uh, biomechanics movement, I would say, is the big thing. Cool. I know some of your work, our more recent work, uh, is with a alongside a, a previous guest of the podcast, Damien Harper, in the area of deceleration. What's what That's... is it about deceleration that has captured your attention and made you want to dive deeper and research and all that kind of stuff? Well, I, I think it has to do a lot with, uh, this started way back when we, we first developed the 1080 Sprint because I really wanted, at, at, at that time, my selfish thinking was, I want to get into change of direction uh, because the, uh, the tests that we had back in the day, or, or we still do, is that we have, uh, and I think Sophia Nymphius does a wonderful job in her article of, of summarizing some of the tests and shortcomings and, and, and what have you with, with the different tests, but multiple terms, different durations, different length of, uh, of, of, of sprints and, and D cells, and the outcome is an overall time. And if you get an overall time of, of multiple turns and really long tests, we know that linear sprint capacity will, will influence the outcome very much. And in other kind of movements, we have always been interested in, def you know, defining different phases. You know, you know, we have gait running. We have different phases of gait and running. Uh, why not apply the same kind of principle and approach into change of direction and, and start to better understand or is it a difference be how you slam on your brakes or, or decel into a turn and then come out of the turn and understanding that because this is something that we observed all the time you, you saw people favoring it and uh, not maybe decelerating in an efficient and a good manner and camouflaging that lack of capacity and then getting a fair or okay time but what do I do with that so 
that was a little bit of the background of me getting into that deceleration side, just getting into the phase specific understanding of change of direction. That was the that was the big deal actually. And then obviously based upon the the great work of Damien, uh, it was just very natural to 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 work with him and taking some of his thoughts and ideas and and then push that forward. So that just became a very natural collaboration in my opinion. So we'll get on to the 1080 sprint and 1080 motion later on. We'll get on to change direction a little bit later on as well. But I want to first start with carrying on with what you just said about deceleration there. And firstly, physical characteristics needed for, for deceleration ability. Let's kind of start at the uh, at the bottom and then we'll work our way up to testing options and, and obviously training options as well. But yeah, what are the physical characteristics to decelerate effectively? Well, there's obviously a greater force demand. So if you look at Newtonian physics there, you, you know, there, there's a shorter period of time. So there's a greater force demand. So there's the force mitigation, the attenuation of, of the forces coming into that term. So that's, that, that's obviously uh, an, an important characteristic. So having that eccentric strength uh, is important. And then it's a matter of also the nature and the technical execution of how you do it. You know, because we see different technical execution as you're going to generate a force or you need that ground reaction force, you know, pointing in the opposing direction, which means that you're going to put yourself into a different posture, which in turn is going to impose different demands on the primarily the lower extremities. And we see that by its greater demands imposed on the ankle knee as compared to the hip, uh, which is slightly different, you know, if you're looking at the acceleration component. So uh, we, we have to look at the force, uh, the rate of force development the, on the eccentric side where, you know, reactive strength index and, and those parameters become, in, uh, become important. And also, Rob, please, if I speak too fast, it's just because I get very uh, into it. So you just slow me down if need be. The cadence is perfect all at the minute. C- keep going. No, so uh, no, I, I think that would be you know some some key components to it, and uh, we have explored this a little bit. Um, actually, just trying to get a better grasp on it. So recently, we uh, we we did a, uh, a a study where we looked at different approach speeds, not coming into a stop, but coming into a turn, and 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 what we're seeing there is that the force demands and how I distribute the force demands are a little bit different dependent upon my approach distance or and and thereby approach speed, approach or entry. Entry is probably better. Entry speed and entry distance. And, And what we see is that the force demands are not necessarily that much greater uh, when it when it comes to and here I, I think I need to go back and just define and refresh uh, how Damien because we applied the methodologies first described by Damien and, and, and co-workers. So you, you're, you're running towards a target, uh, you reach a maximum speed um, and then you're coming to a stop or you're coming to a turn. And when you're coming to a stop, you could call that, that would be a zero velocity. And then you have a 50% reduction and that lends itself to dividing into two phases, which is called early deceleration and then late deceleration. So we looked at the forces, power, impulse, all that stuff, uh, early versus late deceleration and then overall. And it wasn't that big of a difference dependent upon approach, uh, approach or entry speed. Uh, in, in terms of the forces. And then the differences were not that large between the phases, which was a little bit of an interesting finding in a sense. So for instance, in the overall deceleration phase, it was about the same if I had 5 meters in, 10 meters in, or, or, or 15 meters in. So there might be some other things here that's regulating. And this is average forces. This is average forces, I might add. So knowing that, Ola, does that have any impact on our on how we go about testing deceleration? Yeah, because it's it, what was interesting 
was that because that is a question that I've had too. How is a say a five oh five? So you have a very short distance. You you know dependent upon the level of the athlete that you're testing, but they they assume a velocity of four point five five meters per second, which they have to slow down. If you're looking at a fifteen meter approach, you're looking at about seven meters per second that they're slowing down. What was interesting is that with a short, and I think this has this has ramifications of how we approach it and how we think about it, is that in a short five oh five the forces were greater in the short test and in the late deceleration phase. In a longer test, the forces were greater early in the deceleration. So the distribution of how I slam on the brakes or the manifestation or the technical execution is different if I'm having a longer entry versus a shorter entry. And I think that is important. And I think we probably should test both of them. And then we also have to look at the nature of the sport that we're working with. What is the appropriate approach distance? Are we really decelerating maximally from a longer approach versus a shorter approach? And what is relevant for the context that we're working in? So is, that's it me a, just, is it me just simplifying things, Ola? But is that because they've got longer to decelerate, therefore the forces are higher earlier on because they're able to slow down earlier versus in the yeah. short distance where they don't have the opportunity? I think so. Okay. And I think we have to expose them to both, which means that probably the longer one, even though you might approach greater speeds, it might be a better approach actually to get people into a better strategy of decelerating and then maybe progressing it to actually target and tweak it so you can expose a greater force towards the end. But I know we're going to get into injury and injury considerations, and we have to keep that perspective in mind if we're going then to shorter to then increase forces or force demand imposed later in the deceleration, because that is a important and very interesting consideration, in my opinion. Damien mentioned some percentages of max velocity that would have to be hit as a threshold, for a decent for his deceleration test to, to count do you have a similar opinion i can't remember the the exact percentages but do you have a similar yeah. opinion that we have to hit that max velocity threshold before that counts as a valid test uh i think i differ a little bit in that uh, in, in in that regards because i think here is a task um you're going to run from this cone to that cone and you're going to turn around or you're going to go you're going to do uh, come back to another point. Now I'm talking about change of direction in the context of a change of direction. Uh, I want to see how you do that. Um, and then I ask myself the question, uh, how relevant it, is it to reach 90% to really slam on the brakes or 80% and slam on the brakes? I'm more interested in the distance that you cover and then how do you then slam on the brakes? So I'm using more that as a criteria. And then having the athlete self-select. Because you, you see that if you give people a greater approach distance, you see a more of an opportunity to self-select. I'm not, I'm not willing to speed myself up because I might have problems slowing these, these things down. You know, so you, you, you won't speed up or you can't slow down. You know, many people have said this. I know Damien. Uh, many people have said this and, 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 and we do it it's like we do a drop jump right you make an estimate of the height that you have to or you're jumping down from something you will not uh, jump down from something where you cannot land then you take a little bit of a step down or you choose a different technique and I think that's what we're what we are observing with longer uh, entry distances and allowing the athlete to manifest him or herself in that manner so you're leaving it a little bit more open, which is, to me, a very interesting observation because then you can see how they like to do things rather than doing you imposing some, some, some demand. So I'm not saying that approach is right or the other one is wrong, but I different ways of thinking about it. So if we're not standardizing that percentage of max velocity as the, what do you call it, approach entry speed? Yeah. Do we need other forms of technology to dive a little bit deeper into actually the the way 
people are going about that to actually try and make sense of that test if we're not standardizing I, it i i think yeah I, I, but i think it if you had set a distance I, I i see where you're getting at I, I think if you're setting a distance you allow them to self-select their acceleration uh, distance their initial acceleration distance in time what speed they're willing to assume and, and also how they then decelerate and if you want to impose greater and greater demands obviously you can gradually increase that approach distance uh, but if you're going to say one person is decelerating better than another person starting from a similar speed would obviously be better but every person has a different speed so then i have to start at some relative speed and then i have to find that relative speed and then i have to test at that relative speed and then the in my humble opinion then the it has to be easily accessible to the coaches out there so they don't have to be working on computers all the time but rather be hands-on coaching while at the same time getting meaningful data that's that's a little bit of uh what do you, what do you call it in english uh i i one of the things that i really want to achieve is is is, is that part because i want to make it easily accessible and useful without having too much stuff that i have to set up or think about or, 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 or do obviously that comes with its shortcomings yes but um uh, i think that at least that's the way we chose to do it now and I might add, we are not sitting on all the solutions. Um, I, I think this is a field highly underexplored that we we will just continue to explore and get better and better understanding of. Would you mind take us? Would you mind taking us through that that process that you would go through with your basketball players, for example? That's more self selected test versus what Damien's proposing. Just take us through the the step by step delivery of our setup and delivery of that test, just so listeners can get a gauge and maybe try it out for themselves. Yeah, obviously, I have the luxury of having the uh, the ten eighty sprint at my disposal all the time. That is a big disclaimer here. Um, but I, in essence, just set up a course with cones. Um, I also like to have them have a, rather than coming to a stop, having some sort of purpose or, or movement after. So I like to integrate the deceleration analysis with the change of direction because it's, if we observe sport, it's very rare that you just come to a stop. You come to a turn to do something else. It's, it's a transition point into something new. So I always like to have some sort of target afterwards. Um, I'm very, and this is where the, I'm, I'm sure the listener can hear that too, but uh, that's where my motor control, my dynamic systems theory and ecological approaches and all that fun stuff comes into the mix as well, because there, you know, there is, there is something that you're doing afterwards. So then I... Let's interrupt quickly, Ola. Yeah. Just interrupt very quickly. Yeah. What would you, would you standardize that part of the test, that, that, that transition that after change direction and what would that look like 45 that degrees is, 90 uh up until this point i've done 180 degree and 90 degree and then uh, so i set up the cones uh the cone is about 15 centimeters wide uh so i make uh that you have to uh, the turn the, the final cut the plant step is between the cones and hitting that line you're starting at your starting line five meters away. You turn and you come back to that point. You start at 10 meters. You turn and you come back to five meters or 10 meters. Uh, I usually have had reacceleration back to five meters. And then you start at 15 and then you come back to the, the five meter point, five meter mark. So it's a very fast and easy setup, really. It's basically uh, creating a corridor uh, with cones. So uh I, I would have uh eight cones just a very good instruction you're running max effort i want you to run as fast as possible i want you to come back to this cone and i want you to pass it that's also very important i want you to pass come past it 
Uh, so I leave it very open, the instructions. Because then I get an expression of how they choose to do it. And then I also, uh, we haven't integrated it thus far, but I like to film how they execute it at the same time. So I have a, uh, I have a mobile phone uh, on a tripod um, at getting a sagittal view. So if you've got 1080 motion, yeah. sorry, 1080 sprint, if you've got 1080 sprint, what kind of data are you getting out that is useful for you to analyze and rank and therefore prescribe off the back of it? So we'll go for the tech okay. option first. We've got all the tech. We've got the 1080 sprint. Then we'll go for a potential no tech option in a second, but tech option first. Yeah. What data are we yeah. getting? Uh, what data? And here again, we can... We can dig ourselves into a hole here as it comes to data. Uh, and, and I think we have to be careful in that regards. Um, so I, I like to start with the simple, the simplest form, uh, which is most easily understood by athletes and coaches alike. And that is time. So if we divide it into phases, so you have your initial acceleration, you're coming into deceleration phase. We could just look at the duration of that deceleration phase. We can then look at early versus late deceleration phase and just look at times between those two. Uh, I've been starting to explore ratios between them because ratios is a very, very simple form of expressing that time. What we have to be careful with with ratios is that a ratio could be theoretically good, but the overall time could be awful. So the ratio is good, but the overall time is awful. So we have to, to keep the total time in mind here. Uh, so that's, that, that's, that, that's the simplest way of looking at it. And, 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 I, and I like that because people are used to these kind of split or interval times and communicating them, I, I've found to be easier and more comprehensible. By, by by coaches athletes and then you could obviously go a step further because you can look at all right so i have time i have position so i get velocity and how velocity changes as a function of time then you're getting into your deceleration your average decelerations and your maximum decelerations since you have the mass of the athlete, that, that becomes Newtonian physics. You can just compute the force from the force and 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 uh, and the uh, and then this then the distance that you're covering. You get the work. You can then look at uh, the power, and you can also look at the impulse uh, and the momentum and the change in momentum that we're uh, that we're having. So we looked at we've looked at all of these variables, and I think further further work is actually necessary, and more data is necessary for us to actually pinpoint what are the key components here. But I think we're starting to get a better understanding of it. So that's why I'm a little bit open on 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 this one. But I think time is 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 a very simple one, an easy one to use. Um, what we did, what we have seen, is that deceleration power is important and it does change between athletes and it's different for different entry speeds forces are not necessarily all that different what i did find very interesting uh, was that the horizontal impulse and i'm sorry if i'm digging myself into this this physics too far here but what was very interesting was that the horizontal impulse of the momentum early and late was the same and it was consistent you know it, it's uh the early deceleration impulse is the same as the late deceleration impulse and that was consistent and, and it got greater obviously as i have greater speeds i have to just you know there's a greater momentum that i have to decelerate but it was consistent between the early decel and the late deceleration phase so that makes me wonder: Is this a way? Is this a regulatory mechanism that we use actually to uh, for our deceleration? Uh, I don't know, because sometimes people, and a wise person once told me, one of my mentors, 
Ola, the variable that changes might not be the most important. The variables that stay the constant might be the most important ones. So when I saw these data, I was like, hmm, maybe, maybe there's something here. And Sophia Nymphias has been on to this too earlier, and she, she pointed to it back in 2017, I believe, where monitoring that momentum during a change of direction or deceleration might be important. I'm sorry if I'm mixing deceleration and change of direction here. That's fine. I, I think there, as, as deceleration is an integral component of change of direction, I, I, I think I, uh, I I mix them a little bit here. That's or fine. I, I talk a little bit of, 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 on both of them. That's okay. That's okay. Just to clarify, I know you've mentioned it a few times. I know you did um, give us a definition at the start, but early versus late deceleration just gives a recap. Very quickly. Yeah. Yes. No. So in a entry to a turn or to a stop, uh, whatever you choose to do, um, you have an initial acceleration phase. That's from zero to whatever maximum velocity that you're willing to assume. So let's call that Vmax. Then as you come into a stop, you have a V0. There is a zero velocity or... And then uh, you can divide from V max to V zero into two phases. And that can be done based upon velocity. And what Damien proposed and has done is he said that why don't we choose a 50% reduction of the V max? So from V max to a 50% reduction, that's early deceleration. From that 50% reduction to zero, that's late deceleration. Perfect. I think that'll save people maybe going back and going. Just want to clarify yeah. that definition. That's that's perfect. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. No. I, no. And I, I think that's important. And, and uh, I do apologize if I wasn't. Uh, no. 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 You were super clear. I just wanted to. <laughs> just wanted to make sure it was uh, it was clear for everyone else rather than going back. So that's, that's. Yeah. No. That's I. I know. I know. And and that's important because sometimes when I listen to things, maybe I didn't pay attention or the person didn't explain it, and you you just have this nagging question in the back of your mind throughout the podcast or whatever lecture. I actually had one of those experiences yesterday, and I think it was me not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. Glad we uh, we cited that. So in terms of you've got you got your data. You've got your uh, 1080 sprint data. How are you then using that, just maybe in its simplest form, to be able to program, prescribe exercises um, and training programs off the back of it? What's your, what's your process? Right now, since there is not that much reference data available, uh, we are obviously accumulating that internally. Um, or you know, the coaches that I, that I work with here and, and elsewhere. So we have a little bit of some, some reference marks as in, you know, based upon times. Let's keep it simple. Again, communicating out to coaches, not complicate things where you don't have to. Um, and then we, um, we have used an approach of just ranking, um, using quadrants, uh, like where do you, where are you as compared to your peers, uh, particular reference group, team, um, could be a position. Then we're looking at your times and then we're looking, okay. Uh, and then uh, we have also converted that into Z scores to give a kind of like get a little bit of a bar graph to show like, okay, this is how you're distributing. And then based upon that, if, if we see that you, you're pretty, you're you're low on that deceleration side, the, and and it has to be. I'd like to emphasize this. It has to be in conjunction with other tests that we're doing, or other uh, other physical uh, factors, qualities that we're after in training. So, if if we see that someone are not really good at slamming on their brakes, um, using the time, using that distribution. And if this is something that's very low, um, if we have the opportunity to get to talk with the head coach, what do you observe on the pitch? Um, are there certain things that they're favoring? Are there certain things that they're not willing to do? That information in combination with this, then uh, we would probably do something about it. And I think that, and, and, and I think that I found that communication 
with head coaches. And this this has been, I like to call it football, but should we call it soccer? Football. Um, Ola, football. Fo- football. Football. All right. Football. Football it is. That, that's what I call but it. But soccer. We mean soccer, but it's football. <laughs> it's, it's football. No, I agree with you. Um, it, it's been some brilliant conversation with head coaches in football and, and, and team handball where we had taken these these characteristics and we have compared notes with what they actually then see on the ground on the field are there things that you you are seeing they're not willing to go in hard into the press they're in basketball they're 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 sagging off they're gapping um are there things that they're not willing to do can this be one factor that could explain that behavior uh, for instance in basketball are they able to come out and pressure and then be able to slam on the brakes and have a transition into something else or is it because they don't trust the help defense behind them this is an ongoing discussion we had and this is boys 14 15 i'm using them as a little bit of example but but you see it in uh, at higher levels obviously as well I forgot to ask a minute ago when we were talking about testing options. Went through the tech option, but we didn't touch on the no tech option. If that would oh, yeah. change yeah. anything. So if you didn't have the 1080 sprint, you didn't have the ability to get that kind of data, how would you go about that? Because there's going to be more people out there who are listening who don't have a 1080 sprint than do have oh, a 1080 absolutely. sprint. So, oh, so how would that affect how you would go about it? Absolutely. Um Obviously, with, with new technology, uh, video, iPhone, uh, there are many, many things that you can do with that. Uh, your, your phone. I, I'm an iPhone person, so I, I call it iPhone. But whatever phone they have with the new camera options, uh, you can place, uh, have vertical marks behind the athlete. And then you can actually, you know the resolution, the frequency of your capture. It takes a little bit longer, but what was the time from their start? to a certain point uh, that could obviously be, then be the overall deceleration so you could use the iPhone um, laser radar uh, technology perfect uh, works well for that as well so laser and radar is obviously more uh, more people have that so absolutely perfect perfectly fine technology to use I just have the luxury of having the 1080 Sprint available to me at all times. I don't have it in the office right now, but um, uh, those are also good. But but I think you do need some way of getting continuous velocity measurements. That 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 is what you uh, that is the best because then you can really get into D cell. Like you can get okay, what was their maximum? When did they come to zero? The uh, what I do find uh, with radar or laser or uh, or, or motorized resistance, uh, for that matter, is what is Vmax uh, and what are the filters that people? Now we're getting technical, biomechanical here, but what are the filters that people are applying to smooth their data? So you have to be cognizant of how you smooth that data. Um, and the filter that you apply so you you can repeatedly and reliably 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 ob- obtain your, uh, your your vmax values because if they shift in time your deceleration calculations are going to be massively influenced cool right i reckon we transition Oh, sure. change change direction. I know we've discussed it a little bit. Yeah. But focus on the we're going to focus on the injury risk reduction side of things um, to start off with. Mm. I know oh. again someone that I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, you're meeting leads at the conference. Tom DeSantos done a lot of work in this area. But what kind of injury risks are we looking at when it comes to to cutting performance and and, uh, and then we'll dive into some of the training aspects of how we mitigate some of that. But yeah. what are the injury risks in, during cutting? Well, you obviously have all these non-contact injuries and your, your ACL injury is obviously high on that list, uh, unfortunately. Um, and um, I think having, and I think this is really, you know, this, 
deceleration perspective and, and what Tom has done is brilliant. Um, absolutely brilliant. Combining that with what Damien has, has, has done and then starting to look a little bit more granular, taking a little bit of a step back. What, what set that incident up? Because we have gotten a lot of data and information, mostly lab-based, of what happens in the Nivalgus and the Nivalgus moments and, and the milliseconds prior to or right after that final plant or final step in, in that cut. That has been studied extensively. What I would be interested in knowing and understanding uh, a little bit better is what set that up. Uh, were there things leading into that step that could allow us to mitigate and reduce that risk? Or were there something that was going on there that we didn't capture or didn't understand or didn't address in training? So I think... And then, you know, Tom has shown it very, very nicely with, uh, with multiple of his studies. I think this this is an area where uh, hopefully we can shed some knowledge. I'm not saying it is the solution, but at least shed some knowledge on it. And I'm not going to... We have done this. Uh, we, have, we have used this. We have been tested in the biomechanics lab here now for a couple of years and we have applied uh, the 505 and we are going to apply deceleration analysis. And it's a prospective, uh, prospective study of ACL, uh, ACL study here at the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences where they're looking at injury risks in female handball players. And uh, unfortunately, we have had some ACL injuries. So we're going to go back to those data and see are there things here that we could find based upon these approaches and looking a little bit wider at it. So it's uh, hopefully we can shed some light on it. But, but I think this approach really is interesting in that regards. And if and also, if I may add in this context, is the because we look at D cell and we look at the physical uh, capacities. Uh, how about that decision making and how about that agility con uh, component into it? And how about that? We see that there appears to be, from video analysis, it appears to be late decisions, right? Especially in football. Uh, are there things that we could do? To actually work on that. So I've been talking with Gairi Ure, who's a colleague of mine here, is very much into the visual scanning and uh, in, in, in football. And uh, he said it really, really nicely. Uh, Ola, the, uh, the really good footballers would cheat on your test because they will, they will start before the whistle. And he's right. He's right because they're proactive, they're not reactive. So how do we integrate these things together? That is the million dollar question, in my opinion. And that's where it gets very, very complex. That's where it gets very complex. And we have had multiple meetings and discussions. How are we going to address this? How are we going to attack this? What kind of scientific models are we going to use to address this? It's, uh, but it's very interesting. And this next, my next question comes slightly off topic. We're still in the ACL um, yep. change direction injury risk. There was a one of many that's gone on over the last couple of years, especially with the increase in popularity and media coverage of of women's sport. And there was another oh, oh, article excuse, of women's sport, excuse me, yep, especially yep, yep. women's football. And there was an article from a, I don't know if she played for Chelsea or played for someone high level anyway. And she was calling for more help for women in uh, reducing the the injury risk or ACL injury risk. Um, I, I didn't, I just read the the blurb of the, of the article. So I didn't know, I don't know where she was ex wanting that help to come from, whether it was from research, whether it was from practitioners. But there's a lot of, I suppose, misconceptions around why 
female athlete, women athletes are more susceptible to, to ACL yeah. injury risk, especially in these kind of scenarios. Yeah. With with your work, what why why are women getting more or higher risk of ACLs and, and are there some misconceptions that we could potentially get rid of? Well, you know, there males, females, there 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 are some big initiatives coming through and, and another department here at the uh the university or the school is you know one of the world leaders in, in terms of that uh, acl research uh, so there is a call for you know what what is the influence of, of menstrual cycle that's obviously one um, anatomical internal uh, factors external factors um, the, the, the strength components uh the rate of force so that there, there, there are many many different components but if you look at in, in total a lot of it has been in, in sports science in general it's it's male dominant right it's the population is is male dominant there is we, we can't get away uh with, with that so i i think getting more female cohorts and, and understanding these cohorts better uh is a really really good starting point um so there are there are gender differences here that, that we have to account for um so whether it's internal external factors um internal factors there's not so much you can really do with that the ext- well it, well you can you can train you can get stronger you can be more reactive and, 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 and what have you but it's um yeah we have to we have to get a better understanding of it really cool so going back to change direction testing yeah. options i know you'd mentioned that you integrate that change direction aspect into your deceleration and yeah. probably decelerate i'm sorry change direction tests people are still going through the the all the tests that you learn on undergraduate degree and that's probably because we don't have loads of other options but when it comes to integrating the 1080 sprint into change direction tests does that influence your choice of test and would that would you advise the people who've got 1080 sprint to to take up certain tests because it gives you certain information that you can use what's your thoughts on that well yeah i think your the technology at your disposal um seem to have a tendency or or influence on 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 what you do for sure um what we have done uh is trying to create a a a model Uh, and the model is uh, we used the 505, modified 505, or variations thereof, as a quote-unquote template. And then uh, we say, all right, so in the entry phase, that initial acceleration to deceleration, uh, what movement pattern do you choose? Because the movement pattern that you choose, I, I think, is important. It could be running, it could be backpedaling, it could be side shuffling, it dependent upon sport. Then you have some sort of transition, some sort of angular transition. It could be 180, it could be a 90, it could be a lower, lower angle. And then you could actually complete the test with the same movement pattern or a different movement pattern. So we would try to create a model where we're looking at different locomotive patterns, a combination of different locomotive patterns, or the same locomotive pattern. Uh, then, if you have the sprint, does it or, or or some sort of motorized resistance device, will that influence your selection? Yeah, to some extent, it will, uh, because a forty-five degree angle turn wouldn't make sense as you're connected to a line on a drum, that, which in turn is collect, connected to an electrical engine. We have validated data for a ninety degree turn. A ninety degree turn works fine, uh, but obviously the hundred and eighty degree turn is uh, is even better so it lends itself motorized resistance devices lends itself towards more force dominant change of direction and not necessarily the velocity dominant change of direction uh, type testing so you have to keep that in mind and what, what, what do i mean by force dominant versus velocity dominant change of direction tests well any turn greater than 90 can be considered uh, a force dominant change of direction test versus anything 
below a 90 degree is is more of a velocity dominant uh, change of direction test. So I, I think we're mostly targeting towards the force dominant side of the uh, change of direction test. So I, I think that is something that you have to keep in mind. And I think Hader and those guys in 250, and I, I thought that was a really cool study and I cite it all the time. So I like to give a shout out to those guys, but they use, they, they synchronized, you know, the, 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 the two, two uh, I don't remember now, it was a laser or radar, but they synchronized two of them and then they just did a regular straight out forward sprint. They did a 45 degree and a 90 degree angle and you could see how that velocity dropped and the cost of that velocity drop in, in that turn. And I thought that was, you know, a very, very good approach and a very interesting approach because then you get information also in those shallower turns, uh, if you will. So I don't know if I had, I don't know if I answered your question there. Right? No, no, no. So just I'm just going to ask you a follow up on looking at the data from the 1080 sprint when it comes to a change direction. What kind of on a more granular level, what kind of data are you looking at to be able to inform what comes next when it comes to ranking, yeah. programming, etc.? It's it's a lot similar to how I go about just the deceleration component. Um, again, ratio. Uh, now I do a little bit of a bigger ratio. So say you do a 505. So you have, you start, you turn, and you come back to the same starting point. Now you have two, two times. You have time of that first phase, and you have time of the second phase. And you have total time. And we know that a good modified 505, you're looking at 28, 27, uh, something below at least three, uh, three seconds. So you have total time. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind. And then you can start to look at ratios. So we've been looking at ratios here. So we're seeing ratios from 1 to 1.1. Then I divide the deceleration time by the reacceleration or the, let's call it entry phase versus reacceleration phase. So we don't only talk about decel here. Uh, then we're looking at ratios of 1.1 to 1.4 to 1.5. And, and if you have a really high one there, that's when I'm thinking, hmm, that's a that's that entry phase. And we know then that deceleration is a key component. Then I dive into that deceleration component. Uh, if the phases are fairly similar and the times are low, I'm like, okay, maybe maybe we'll look elsewhere at things we should focus on. So I start simple again. Start simple, looking at times. Uh, what has been interesting, and, and the cool thing about doing a 505 is that it's one turn. You get information about the strategies, the technique, the physical qualities that they're able to, to, um, to do um, off of one leg. Let's say you test the left first. Then you do the same thing with the right. Sometimes you find big differences left, right. And then you start to think, okay, let's say you have a footballer. All right, where do you play on the pitch? Are you Ariane Robben who's just running down the right-hand side and doing a 90-degree cut uh, to your left to go in and then shoot? Uh, everyone knows it's coming. He still <laughs> managed to score tons of goals doing that. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Uh, so are there things that then you will target to try to, okay, I'm going to try to make that one side better, or are we going to just, like Adi and Robin did, perfect this one specific movement? Because I was that, thinking well, of the same a, person. Yeah. That was, that, that's a bigger discussion. A little funny story on that one, if you don't mind. Uh, it was, uh, I was watching the warm up. I was in, in Rome watching Champions League. It was Roma against the Bayern Munich. And Bayern Munich was uh, having their regular warm up and the whole team was warming up. And there was one guy running up and down, cutting to his left on the right wing. Guess who that was? So he had a very, very, very spe specific warm up to exactly what was coming. I believe he scored two goals on that movement in that game. Well, setting set, setting himself up for it. So, so, so I think having that one turn and being able to look left, right, and again going back to to the pitch 
like what is happening on the pitch are the position things that are needed that we really see he should work on or she um really lends itself to to some interventions and, and then training strategies if again match the same questions I did with the deceleration topic yep. if you didn't have the 1080 sprint would yep. you still go with a 505 or modified version and would you look at video as well and yeah i would uh i really like the video uh because the thing is that if you have whether it's laser or radar or motorized resistance you you have a, some sort of velocity development and that's nice and everything but i'd like to know like i said introduction wise you know i'm i'm a movement i've always been interested in movement and observing how people move having that additional information on how they created that speed uh is to me very very important uh so using video absolutely if you're doing a 180 degree turn radar um laser sure uh photo cells uh many people have those available the only thing about photo cells um is that you know where how you set them up relative to the turn and what kind of trunk lean or lean that the athlete have coming in you know how you hit those dual beams and how you cross them can be influenced so you have to be cognizant of that and another thing actually that i look at in change the direction too is that if you even if you set up a 505 course you see that the center of mass actually hasn't moved five meters because you will have that plant step outside and you see that the better lean that the athletes have, the shorter distance they actually do cover. And people are wondering, it's like, well, is, the, is, is it wrong? Is it a wrong measurement? No. It's just a good technical execution of the task. So they actually didn't move that far, which means that they could cover it in a shorter period of time. So I even look at distance measurements there. Just when you come, because video, you've mentioned it a couple of times, and this is again, mm -hmm. don't mean, don't, don't want to dumb things down too much. But how would you set up that video for a 505? Sagittal plane? Uh, sagittal plane, yeah. absolutely. So if you have two, it, it's really good to get a, uh, call it a frontal plane or, you know, from the front and from the back. Now I base it on a 180 degree, cur uh, degree turn. I'm using that as a reference just so people can visualize it um uh, sagittal uh if i only have one phone i would do sagittal if i have two i would add the frontal because sometimes you see um they come in at a straight line and then they have a curved re-acceleration re out of it um so you're basically covering a little bit greater distance than you really have to um so they're not really able to to get that plant turn and really come back to where they came from so that that could give you that information and also it could give you information if you're looking at pelvis positioning and all that stuff in the frontal plane that that's really good to get from the front and the back in terms of the side view uh the trunk positioning uh ankle knee um you can get that really nice from the central view perfect and tom's gonna talk about this topic when it comes to um cutting and and injury risk uh, during cutting movements in in leads at the speed conference which would be very very exciting i'm really looking forward to that one so um uh, the lineup there is fantastic so uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one i didn't even ask you to say that either but thank no, you no <laughs> no 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 it's uh I looked at the lineup and I was like, this is applied, uh, highly, uh, really, really good researchers. And, and that's the mix where you really get some really good discussions. And no, wonderful. And I find also the practitioners and uh, to be really progressive and, and coming up with some great thoughts and ideas and they're trying things out. And I think working with those people is, is wonderful. And combine that mix with some crazy scientists and you have a you have a good lineup absolutely no thank you very much well 
Oh, look, I think we could probably go definitely for another hour on these kind of things and, and dive into loads more topics. But I think we're going to cut it there because we've got we, we've got nearly an hour of, of really good stuff, especially around the deceleration stuff, which I think is piquing a lot of people's interest. So I think that first half hour will be really yeah. of, of, of real interest to people. Um, but if anyone wants to dive into a bit more of your research or see what's coming down the pipe for you guys or more about 1080 Motion... Where's the best place for people to 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 get in to find more information? Well, you can uh, you find me on Twitter. I'm I'm a little bit of an on and off type of Twitter guy. Um, so uh, if you find me at uh, I don't even remember my Twitter tag. We'll link but, to it. Uh, you, you, it's all you, good. We'll, you, you, you you link to it. Uh, LinkedIn, I am uh, sometimes as well. Uh, ResearchGate, uh, you can find publications. Uh, you also find information at our uh, at the homepage of our school, uh, which is uh, www.nih.no for Norway. And then, if you're interested in in, in 1080 Motion, um, you find that at uh, 1080motion.com and all all the social media platforms and and what have you. Where we we like to share knowledge, and, and there's a whole bunch of webinars there that you might be finding helpful. And and speaking of uh, of, of Damien, we have had a number of of, of, of webinars and presentations there so that that could be of interest to you as well perfect now the list of people on the uh webinar series is superb so yeah definitely uh it shoot is, over there and, and have a little watch of those yeah and and if, if you do watch those webinars um we uh many times we've set up the q a sessions afterwards so we we've filmed them afterwards because we get a ton of questions and and there have been some some really really good discussions. So I would recommend you also to listen to that because then we get into discussion uh, questions from the audience. So those are really really helpful actually. Perfect. Well, Ola, thank you very much for your time. Really do appreciate it. Uh, look forward to meeting you in person in March. But for now, Great. I'll say uh, I'll say thank you and um, have a good rest of the day. Thank you, sir. Thanks, mate. Speak soon.